You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 142. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast. And boy, do I have a show for you today. I'm super excited to present today's guest. I got to do this interview in person when I was actually teaching for her at her critically acclaimed, widely well-known festival, the Aerial Dance Festival in Boulder, Colorado. And you can see my performance from that Aerial Dance Festival on Patreon. What's Patreon, you ask? Actually, you're probably not asking this because you've probably listened to other episodes of the podcast before and you've heard me talk about it. But whether this is your first time or your 142nd time, let me tell you, Patreon is the place to be. It's a place where you can give small amounts of money every single month to creators just like me to create things just like this. Every single dollar goes into the podcast and then the dollars that aren't in the Patreon go out of my own wallet to pay my editor, to pay my assistant, to pay all the fees that are associated with having a podcast of this scope and magnitude. And it's totally worth it. But I love having help from the community. It means the world to me. And of course, I give you a little extra secret special bonus behind the scenes for it. So if you love what you're listening to, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete and sign up to become a Patreon today. My guest today is Nancy Smith. Nancy originally wanted to be an astronaut or a race car driver. Instead, she became the founder and artistic director of Frequent Flyers Productions in 1988 and the Aerial Dance Festival in 1999. She teaches a variety of topics for Frequent Flyers professional training students and teaches dance trapeze, invented apparatus, and Skinner releasing technique around the country. Choreographing more than 350 aerial dances and evening-length works, her choreography has been presented at places such as the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. and at Cirque du Soleil in Montreal, just to name a few. Nancy has taught more than 4,000 students the joy of dancing in the air. She's received numerous honors, including the Living Legends of Dance in Colorado Award and the Women Who Light the Community. She co-authored the first book on aerial dance and Dreams of a Prehensile Tale. And Dreams of a Prehensile Tale. Yeah, so I'm just reading that straight from the bio. Not clear if she dreams of having a prehensile tale herself or just like in general the concept of prehensile tale. But there it is. And here is my interview with Nancy Smith. Nancy Smith. Welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yay. So can you start by telling the people who you are and what you do? Hi, people. Yes, I people. am <laughs> I am Nancy Smith, and I am the founder and artistic director of Frequent Flyers Aerial Dance in Boulder, Colorado. Pretty much sums it up, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wear a lot of hats. Yeah. yeah. Let's go back to like the beginning. I saw your piece this weekend. It was beautiful. And you're from the South. You're a Southern girl like me. Grew up in New Orleans. New New Orleans. When did you find aerial dance? Did you find it first or were you a dancer? I was a dancer. Like a ground dancer. I was a ground based dancer. Okay. I started doing ballet in second grade because my second grade teacher was a ballerina. I went and saw, I don't know, Swan Lake or something. And I just pointed at what was happening on the stage and said that. Mmm, that's awesome. Cool. And that went up through high school? So, no, in middle school, I discovered boys. Yeah, that'll happen. Yeah, and wildness and (laughs) stopped dancing. But at the end of uh, a very short tenure in high school, because I ended up skipping some years uh, and living in France part of high school, I uh, had to have major abdominal surgery right before I went off to college. 
And I got to college and I thought, well, I need to do something because I felt, you know, not strong in my body. I'd lost a lot of weight. And I started taking some dance classes. Where did you go to college? It's called the Colorado College. It's a private college down in Colorado Springs. Okay. And the man who was uh, running the dance, dance program, which they didn't have a degree in dance at the time, but they had a lot of wonderful classes. His name uh, was Norman Cornick, and he was one of the original dancers with a famous modern company, Lester Horton. Oh, wow. And so I started taking about three hours of dance a day and then performing. And next thing I knew, I wrote my own major in fine arts and dance, putting, pulling together all the things I'd been studying up to my senior year. And I had to write a thesis and that became you know, my trajectory at that point. My thesis was about the use of imagery to facilitate neuromuscular re-education because I was really interested in the brain-body connection. Wait, that's so cool. The use of imagery to say it one more time? Facilitate neuromuscular re-education. And is that, and when you say imagery, do you mean looking at an image in front of you and that stimulates the re a re-education process? Or is it you imagining movement and then executing that movement? There's many pathways, but the one that uh, I was studying was ideokinesis. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of people who were writing about it at the time, and then there were people who were researching the brain-body connection from the scientific point of view. But as I was writing that thesis, uh, Norman came across a flyer for Skinner releasing technique in Seattle that Joan Skinner developed over the course of her lifetime, more than 50 years. And that was a very specific training using imagery to re-educate the body. And that is spoken word imagery and hands-on things that are called graphics hmm. that help the body understand how to be uh, aligned in space. So the summer between, I had gotten accepted into UCLA for graduate school. The summer between college and graduate school, I went and did a three-week immersion, basically, in, in skin and releasing technique, and I was absolutely blown away. It changed my life. I was completely hooked. Went on to UCLA, was studying dance and kinesiology for, in the master's uh, program, and ended up getting a grant to bring Joan Skinner and her co-artistic director, Bob Davidson, down to UCLA to conduct an experiment, whereby we hooked Bob up to a Maya. It's a, it measures the electrical activity of your muscles. Of your muscles. I also had a control subject. My premise for the research was, uh, is it a learned skill or can anybody just imagine the movement and they're operating at this really amazing low functional level that's training the body? What is what a learned skill? Uh, using imagery. Oh, okay. So we hooked them both up and Joan was there, Joan Skinner, and then she gave the prompt. And the prompt was very simple. Uh, she said, you know, you basically you're laying down on the floor and you're okay. sliding your arm along the floor up over your head and then back down. Your, your arm doesn't come off the floor. Okay. And then, uh, so that the my, myelograph, <laughs> measuring the muscle electrical activity, was measuring that. And then she gave the prompt just to imagine the arm moving. And gotcha. for Bob, who's trained in the use of imagery many, many years, he'd been with Joan, the firing of the muscles was at just a lower amplitude than the exact movement that he had done when he was moving his arm. Okay. So that, is, that was the premise for showing that it's a way to train the body without any extraneous... And in the control group, they couldn't imagine, or the same muscles Correct. didn't fire as they when they not. moved the arm. They did not. So working with imagery, at least in that controlled experiment, A, is a means by which to train the body to move efficiently and with economy and ease, uh, no extraneous movement, effortlessness. This but was, it presupposes that you have to have some the training training exactly. before you do that, right? Exactly. Gotcha. So it's a learned skill. It's, it's a learned skill. So those are the two things. You can train your body, but you do also need to learn how to drop into this. Uh, it's it's pretty much an altered mental state when you are working in this way, imagining the movement. Joan you used, she's passed now, and mm -hmm. many teachers still around the world, and I'm, I'm a teacher of Skinner, uh, use um, Skinner releasing to, in the, it, her poetic imagery. It's very poetic because she also believed that that went really deeply inside the person. <laughs> As you're t describing this experiment, describing even your um, academic trajectory, I'm like, this all sounds very sciencey. It was. But you don't, you're not a scientist, you're an artist. 
So how do you kind of marry that with expression, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you're getting to with yeah. poetry? Well, what was interesting, at the time I was doing this research at UCLA, the only way to really measure the brain-body connection was to pretty much drill into people's heads. This, oh. pre this preceded MRIs and other tools that we now wow. have to map the brain. I know, I'm old. <laughs> so what? Uh, so I ended up leaving graduate school and moving to Seattle to actually train full-time with Joan because I, it was the doing of it that I became interested in since I couldn't uh, further the scientific component the way I wanted to. Okay. Because I didn't want to go into the whole like drilling. Into Are people sense. studying it now that they have more sophisticated technology? You know what? That is such a good question. Not to my knowledge. In, huh. fact, in fact, there's a book that just came out of essays by uh, some of the teachers of Skinner um, and beautiful essays comparing it to Zen Buddhism and also certain forms of um, therapeutic training, hmm, mind-body mind, mm -hmm, work. Sure. So people have taken it into many applications and are still teaching and using it. Joan was using it to train dancers, but also many, many people in the community from children on up did Skinner releasing because it was such an amazing modality, or is. So I ended up going and studying with Joan. So you were like, by UCLA. Yeah. I got better things to do. Yes. And I was an apprentice in Joan's company, and she had a, an improvised music and dance ensemble, basically. Everything was improvised. All the performance hmm. material and all the music. Her husband, a very well-known jazz musician in Seattle at Cornish Institute, and these famous jazz musicians would come in and jam, and then they would perform live. And wow. It was the most, at the time, that was pretty cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, back in the day. And I was just such a devotee because I had done all this classical training in ballet and modern and jazz. And, you know, I had character day. I'd had the traditional trajectory of a dancer. Uh -huh. And when I got to the Skinner work, it was mind blowing to drop down inside and find your own movement and also work from this poetic space. So, to your answer, that. Um, Imagery is one of the ways I like to train other people. Mm -hmm. Also the ability to um, work with conceptual ideas and then manifest them physically and in performance is really mm -hmm. the trajectory I went on when I started doing, uh, well, all my choreography, but specifically in the aerial realm. Yes. So when did the aerial, when did you go from the ground to the air? Well, I will say that as a child, I um, swung on swings relentlessly. I spun till I got dizzy and fell down. Yeah. And I was in trees most of the time. In fact, I left my first day of kindergarten. I ran away and they found me in a crabapple tree many hours later, <laughs> ill from eating all the crabapples. Oh my God. But I, anything that got me off the ground. Yeah. Um, I had a magnolia tree in my front yard that I used to climb up. Best. Yeah. They're really good to climb. Love magnolia trees. So I was in Seattle. And I moved back to Colorado for personal reasons. And I was here not even a full year. And Bob Davison, Jones, co-artistic director, um, produced a piece called Airborne Meister Eckhart. Huge theatrical piece with lots of singers and aerial. And it was about the mystical, the mystic um, Meister Eckhart from the 13th century. Beautiful, had you know spoken word and all, all this stuff. I happened to go back to visit Seattle and saw the piece and saw the aerial. And the moment I saw it, I went that. Yeah, because it would marry together my, you know, my innate love, swinging, spinning, climbing, mm -hmm. with dance and performance. Yeah, sure. So that, that was in 1986. And when you say aerial, what did you see? Like uh, dance trapeze, single point, as we called it then, low flying, low -flying trapeze. trapeze yes. Which back in the day was on wooden bars, exactly, right? Exactly, With yes. the big cotton ropes. Yes. So Actually, were, the ropes weren't very big, but the okay. elbows were big and bulbous. <laughs> yeah, the big old like, couch <laughs> trapezes is what I like to think of them Comfy. as. Comfy. Yeah, so very different from um, if you think about a single point trapeze now that's mm -hmm. on a triangle and a lot of people do technique that spins really fast. This low flying is generally a lighter bar. It's not steel and it's traditionally uh, not on a pulley, right? Correct, although I think, you know, early on people were experimenting with pulleys. Okay. Uh, it, it, but yes, it wasn't about being raised and lowered Yes. Uh, so much. But early on, people were experimenting with all kinds of things. So the lineage, Bob, Bob was exposed to Terry Sengraff. She is the acknowledged mother of aerial dance. Terry had done some circus high-flying trapeze. 
She was also a trampoline artist who there at the time there was not Olympic sport of trampoline, but had there been, she would have been a competitor. Okay. She was also responsible for women's gymnastics spreading across the country and becoming a competitive, a real sport. Wow. And in the Olympics. I know, I didn't know that till I read her biography. I had no idea. We were very dear friends. I had no idea. So in any event, um, his lineage was through Terry and my lineage was through Bob initially. But Terry, from doing the circus trapeze, high flying, yeah. began to experiment. She got her dance degree here at CU Boulder and then moved to Arizona for her master's and then to the West Coast. Okay. She experimented with taking the bar, you know, five feet off the ground, and then eventually the two ropes going to a single point of attachment, so they spun. No uh -huh. swivels. It was all about winding and unwinding, Yeah. which is a wonderful thing to play with. If you're used to working with a swivel, the, yeah. that quality is so fun to play with of how it slows down and speeds up and slows down and speeds up. So anyway, that was Terry then began experimenting with the ground to air. And then she started working on bungee and all kinds of things. Um, so she was continually inventing. And, and she also was responsible for um, a lot of the stilt dancing work that's happened in the country up to when David Clarkson came. Okay. She started a, um, Women Walking Tall as a means of empowerment. So they did public you know, happenings, basically, in the Bay Area. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Brilliant innovator. Yeah, she sounds like it. I wish I had met her at some point. She was... She, she was tremendously influential on many, many people. And her lineage as a modern dancer who also, you know, had this this gymnastics circus background, um, we trace it back to Alan Nikolai, who was one of the kind of bridge, the modern dance and postmodern movement. He was a brilliant human who did, created his own music and his visual art. And he experimented with aerial as a means by which to express certain ideas. So he was not an aerial choreographer, but he would have aerial apparatus in various things as a way to express an idea he had that could only be expressed by leaving the ground in this way. Hmm. Can you give an example? Yes. He did a piece where he had um, a bar apparatus. It was like, I guess it must have been a trapeze. And he had all these mirrors around it. And he was very theatrical. His costuming, everything like t down to the nth degree was planned out. But he had this piece where the dancer needed to be off the ground moving and hanging. And so that was what served him at the time. He also then was in France and he did an installation piece where uh, he got gymnasts to be part of the performance along with his dancers. And he uh, hung basically the kind of ropes you would have seen in a gym okay. at the time yeah, from yeah. the trees. Okay. And it was called Bird People. Huh. And these gymnasts had to climb up the rope and down the rope, and it was just part of it. It was like, and then this parade went through the middle of the road, and all this, you know, it was like yeah, a, nice. a nice, beautiful performance art kind of piece. Mm -hmm. So he, he was a person who used tools that served his ideas. Alongside of that, then you have um, the famous modern dancer, Trisha Brown, who dance, had has a piece called Man Walking Down. Man Walking Down side of the building that's probably not I'm gonna interrupt you yeah not because this isn't fascinating yeah. but because there's something of, that I'm curious about you in all of these stories that you're telling and that's about lineage one of the things you said when even when I came in to teach for you at the aerial dance festival here in Boulder Colorado go look it up I'll drop the links in the show notes something that you said on that very first night was that it's very important to recognize and name your lineage and I'm wondering why you take that stance, why the people are as important to you as the movement or the ideas. So back to the lineage, back to the idea of Trisha Brown, man, yeah. man walking down building. She had somebody in a rope and harness who, it was a durational piece where they literally walked face down toward the ground, down the building uh -huh. uh, with rope and harness, way before anybody was doing this kind of work. And at postmodern movement, people were breaking out of the box everywhere, yeah. whatever. So. When I started studying aerial dance and then founded Frequent Flyers and the Aerial Dance Festival after that, there was a lot of question about what is aerial dance? Everybody thought it was circus. Uh -huh. When I first yeah. started doing it and tried to get funding for my company, the funders loved it. It was a great visual. And, and at that time, they were funding multidisciplinary work, which yes. we were doing big installation pieces. Cool. But they didn't quite understand it. Um, Presenting agents had no idea what it was at the time. Yeah. Because there were only about 12 of us in the country when I started, literally. 
Um, and then some grant panelists didn't understand it either, didn't know, even know how to look at it. Yeah. And my contemporaries in the modern dance field thought it was gimmicky. And so I started having a conversation with um, a woman who was in my company at the time, Jane Bernasconi, who moved away to start her own company in Baltimore about what can we do to explain the lineage so that it's clear? Where did it come from? Because it didn't come from a circus other than Terry had dabbled in high-flying trapeze. But it really was a postmodern dance movement by dancers initially. So we sat down to do the research. As we began doing the research, Janie and I thought Terry was the first per and only person to have started it. And she started in the late 70s. And she was already, I think, in her 40s. She'd been a dancer and gymnast, as I mentioned. Turned out there was a woman in New York named Stephanie Evanitsky. And Stephanie had a um, multi-gravitational dance company. And she was a visual artist who partnered with a dancer who had been working with Alan Nikolai, fact Alan Nikolai. We were able to interview Stephanie. She had, she, I won't even go into the long story about her. She's fascinating. She unfortunately recently passed as well. Both she and Terry are now uh, no longer with us. But she um, was doing crazy, amazing, like postmodern, psychedelic kind of work. She also did pieces in the rigging of tall ships. She got money from the Guggenheim to mount performances. She went to Europe and then she walked away from her company. None of that stuff on the East Coast had the diaspora that Terry Sengraff did on the West Coast. She didn't train people who then went on to train more people. Mm -hmm. That lineage sort of died out. Mm -hmm. Whereas Terry's went on to teach many people who then went on to take it into their own realm. Mm -hmm. So Janie and I wrote a book. We wrote, mm -hmm. wrote The History of Aerial Dance, and it's got essays with the pioneers. It's got Terry and Bob, Stephanie Evanitsky, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the whole, the, the people that we felt were influential. This way, when people ask, what is aerial dance? It's circus, right? We could say, actually, no. It was inspired by Alan Nikolai, postmodern dance movement. Here are the people it came through. Steve Paxton, who was the founder of Contact Improvisation, I don't know if your, your listeners will even know much about that art form, but he was asked recently, is there any point in um, preserving or talking about the origin of Contact Improv? And his response was really interesting, and I think about it in regard to your answer about aerial dance, which is, it did have a pure form in its beginning. Mm -hmm. And this is how it started, and this is what it looked like, and these were the original practitioners. It has now gone off into many, including um, bondage. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, there's all kinds of things. Well, and it's almost gone full circle again, where I'm like, w is this aerial dance, or is this circuit, you know? Because it's being called one thing, but it's so interdisciplinary. Correct. But so it sounds like your answer is one of the reasons to track lineage is to understand the, or categorize the art form. Kind of, and I think it's become, you know, I, I can categorize what the origin is and what it was like in the beginning, um, you know, from doing the research and looking at footage and talk, interviewing people and knowing people and then coming from that lineage. When we started the Aerial Dance Festival in 1999, in the second year, we brought Elsie and Serenity out. Yeah. And we immediately brought Circus in. Yeah. And it became a cross-pollination. It was interesting early on because there was sort of two camps. You know, we're the Aerial Dance Camp. We're the yeah. Not on purpose. Right. But no, it just, sure. you know, there were people who came specifically to study with Terry or me or some of the other teachers who were coming from that lineage. And there were other people who came to do the circus work. Yeah. But what happened was the artists who came were influenced by one another. Yeah. And the students who came and they started blending uh -huh. and cross-pollinating. And so I wouldn't even say it's diluted. It's just grown and morphed and also, I think, circled back. Like you mm -hmm. said, I remember when Kevin O'Connor came, mm -hmm. he had a very contact improv-based solo he did. Uh, his interaction with the rope was contact improv, and then he did another piece the next year with another dancer where they were actually doing contact that moved on to the rope. And he trained in contact improv because it's still as... Right, but also went to the National Circus School. Exactly. So there's the blend. There's one of the blendings. Did that answer? Oh, I have one more one more thing to say. Which oh yes, I, about you know acknowledging where you learn something or your yeah. lineage. You've heard the phrase "credit where credit is due." I think there's a sort of a um, quick fix. Learn it on you know the internet, on video. Learn from other people. But 
claim it as your own. People actually steal things, which I don't care for. Mm -hmm. I don't acknowledge where they've trained or learned something. I think our ancestry, our lineage is super important. I think gratitude. Mm. In general in the world, we need way more gratitude. I have so much gratitude for the people that have influenced me and want to give thanks to them and help teach the people coming up now through me and around me to understand the value of the gratitude and how it opens up different ways of thinking and being in the world. It's a practice of gratitude to acknowledge this. Uh, as I was putting together this interview or like going through these questions and and even hearing you speak now, I think it, it crosses my mind that, you know, like a lot of people were taught by Ter- Terry Sungraf. A lot of people uh, learned Skinner Technique. A lot of people went to UCLA and did all the things you're doing. But how did Nancy, like, what is it about you that created frequent flyers in 1988 and then went on to create a very, it is not, div- it is not easy to have an, I don't need to tell you this, but to have an aerial festival or to open a studio or to run, especially in America with the arts funding we have or don't have. It is not easy to do this. Did you have, did you come from a business background? Did your parent, like where did, there is a skill set that allows for kind of the um, perpetuity of these kinds of institutions. And I'm wondering where or how you picked that up. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. You always ask great questions when listening to your other podcasts. I never meant to do this. Mm. I was just following my curiosity and my passion. And along the way, while I was dancing, I had a lot of different jobs. Okay. Um, In the summers in college, I worked for my sister who had a real estate agency, and she taught me all the front office stuff you know, typing and telephone and customer service. That was a great skill. She's a tremendous businesswoman. And then in, um, after I graduated uh, college and I was in Seattle, I, had a, I did door-to-door sales of vacuum cleaners in the rain. What? Yeah, it was crazy. Only in the rain? Only when it was raining? Because Seattle was always raining. Oh. So anyway, I, uh, and then uh, Joan Skinner's company had a small advertising agency that did brilliant marketing. And I was so taken with what they were doing, I got a job there as their front desk person. And then I got hired by them to be an account executive managing um, the uh, client roster. Wow. And then I parlayed that into moving to a bigger agency. This is all while I'm dancing. This is just to pay for my dancing. Right. And I ended up having large clients like Krusty's Pancake Mix and Blue Cross Blue Shield on the West Coast and a chain of restaurants. And I became an account executive and an account supervisor. I just did this for a few years, but I learned so much about marketing. So I had had the sort of business experience, I had the marketing, but all of this was just so I could afford to dance. And when I, you know. That's distressing and <laughs> fascinating and amazing. <laughs> Because I know other people and I myself uh, hit a point where I was like, I am only going to fund my life through my art. Mm-hmm. However that needs to happen, I am only going to allow for that. Because other what like I saw the trajectory that other people went on where it's like it slips and slides and then you have deadlines. And so you can't make it to dance class or you can't make it to training or you get married, you know, like things happen. And all of a sudden you're not doing it anymore. And I was like, the only way that I can continue to do this is if this is the only means I have to support myself. But it sounds like for you, what you're saying is that picking up all those skills on having that other job is what got you here. Yes, and I uh, also was, um, there used to be an organization in town, Colorado Dance Festival, that brought modern dance and tap and all kinds of amazing things to Boulder. Mm -hmm. And it went on for many years until they folded. Um, And when I moved here, the first year they brought Bob Davidson and Bob was using community people and I'd already been training on my own for about eight months because he gave me a trapeze after I'd studied it in, in one summer before and performed in Airborne Meister Eckhart. The next year, the Colorado Dance Festival asked me to teach dance trapeze because by then I was doing it. And that's when I started Frequent Flyers because I wanted to make a company to make work primarily. Mm-hmm. But because of the dance, Colorado Dance Festival, I was already teaching which I hadn't really meant to do. Really, I was doing it as a performance art form. Yeah. I could not 
um, stop looking up. What can I hang from and what can I do? <laughs> you know, I made these big installation pieces early on in, cool. the, in the company outside and theatrical productions. Original name for the company was Frequent Flyers Aerial Dance Theater because I was so influenced by Bob's work and other people's work of the theatrical component. Yeah. Yet it wasn't theater. I'm not trained in theater. It was mm. like this blending. So, um, also to support myself, because it was about 10 years into Frequent Flyers before I got a salary. That's, you know, scrappy. Again, funding terrible in this country. I'd get project money. There wasn't money to have beyond paying for our rehearsal and teaching space and making right. shows to pay me. So I also became the executive director for the, um, it's basically the art service organization for Boulder County. Okay. And then I helped do the cultural plan for the city of Boulder, which took three years. And that was also a tremendous learning experience. So all of that while I'm doing frequent flyers. But it gave wow. me lots of connections in the community. Yeah, and you know everybody. I did at the like time. This was quite a while ago. So frequent flyers eventually became sustainable, um, where I could have a salary. We still weren't doing a lot of classes. We were doing shows and the festival. And we ended up moving out of the art center where we were based, the Dairy Art Center where you just performed. Yes, beautiful into, into our first studio in 2010. And that was a huge leap. We went from... Wait, so you founded the company in 1988 and didn't have your own space until 2010. We were based at the... Well, we were based in a couple other places. That's a longer story. I helped found another organization called Space for Dance. Okay. We were based there. Anyway, because you <laughs> when do, do you, you do you sleep? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> or like, is that just not a, like, just plug in and keep going? I think, you know, being driven is actually a characteristic one could say about me. Yeah, huh. I would say so too. So anyway, we were in these various spaces that were rehearsal performance spaces. And then the Dairy Arts Center was coming online in 1990. And uh, Space for Dance moved in there. And then Space for Dance wanted to move out of there. And I stayed because mm. I had a feeling Space for Dance wouldn't thrive once it moved out of the building. And so we stayed and I, we had an office and we had permanent performance space. And I mean, not permanent, but we could rely on and plan ahead oh, for wow. shows yeah. and rehearsals and classes. So we gave us stability. Yes. But again, by the time 2010 rolled around, right before that, we were doing four classes a week, but then producing the festival and all of the, the shows that Frequent Flyers and I were creating. Moving into the other studio, the first studio, we literally grew 200% in two weeks. We had 200 people come through the door in what? the first two weeks to do our sampler classes. Wow. And then we built our um, professional training program, our nine month program. We already had a youth at risk program called Kids Who Fly for at risk youth, which we still do. It's in its 21st year. Um, but we were able to expand that because we had our dedicated facility. In mm -hmm. the dairy, we were in the performance space. So right. we had to share it, we had to take equipment up and down. Yeah. And then in 2015, we realized we couldn't, it wasn't really a viable model because we don't do multiple classes at the same time in the same room. Yeah. It's just the way we hold the container. Yeah. And which I really like. Oh, good. By the way. Oh, good. And I think other people really like because I'm very loud when I teach. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one. So <laughs> anyway, we, we realized that, you know, that, that 4 to 9 p.m. weekdays and then weekends, yeah. you only have one class at a time. So financially, we couldn't make enough money. Okay. This second studio in 2015 came available. The landlord basically said, you have about three minutes to tell us if you want to take over this space. Cool. But we hadn't put together a business plan. We hadn't figured out how we were going to afford it. It was insane. It was insane. So then we opened the second studio, which you're now sitting in the conference room. And it's still a struggle in the pandemic, of course. Um, right. It's amazing we're still here. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, cockroaches. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> Maybe I'll do a piece. I'll do I'll do um, <laughs> Maybe the cucaracha. <laughs> I'll do Metamorphosis by Kafka There next. you go. Do a cockroach piece. Oh my piece. God, that's incredible. Um, yeah, actually segueing into you, so as a business owner and director, you've been incredibly successful. Congratulations. I think the measure of success is cockroach status, actually, <laughs> I would say. Um, but as a creator and as a, artistically, you also direct the company, yes? I do. Yes. Yes. Well, cool. it was all started because I wanted a vehicle for my artistic expression, yeah. period. Yeah. That was it. So 
you have a, a company, I'm looking at their names out there, the faculty. Are they a salaried company or how do you work with your dancers? First of all, how do you choose dancers? Do you call them dancers? Do you call them aerialists? What do we refer to them as? Aerial dancers. Yeah, oh, of course. Um, Obviously. You know, it's changed over the years because when I first started the company, I had a lot of different kinds of people in the company who mm. had a lot of different backgrounds, climbing, gymnastics, um, contact improv, dance. Almost everyone we then trained to do aerial. Interesting. So they started yeah. as some form of ground-based mover or, yeah. or climber or whatever, gymnast, and then we trained them. And what was great about that is that I could craft sort of their... Uh, you know, I, I was able to craft the sort of aerial they were doing. And also the dance department at the university here, I would recruit, like Daniel Hendricks and Valerie Morris came out of that, who are still with me after 27 years, wow. um, and amazing people, performers and so forth, teachers. But then it shifted, um, you know, and we started having more and more teachers come in and finding people who could teach aerial arts, um, shifted the dynamic and circus based skills were always coming in now i hold auditions and i look for people who can who have ground based movement training and aerial training interesting and so that i can blend the two in the past what i had to do early on was use people to their strengths like mm -hmm. the people who didn't have dance training but had climbing keep them in the air, don't have them do much on the ground, <laughs> literally. Yeah, it's sure. really like a hard brain exercise to figure out how to make things look really good without right. having an ensemble cast that could do all of the things. Now I've been lucky enough, especially as we have recruited through our professional training program, so again, indoctrination <laughs> is, to be able to um, make work with people who have high-level aerial skills and ground-based movement training. I will say that it's hard to have a company right now in particular. It's shifted a lot in the last four years, partly due to the pandemic, in that um, Boulder is really expensive to live here. Mm. Most of the people who used to perform with me and lived in Boulder are, have either moved away where they can afford to now have a family or, or they've moved to Denver, which is a commute. Yeah. And there are now many other aerial studios at which to teach. When we started, there was nobody else for a really long time. And then right. we trained some of our own competition. Yeah. We moved to Denver, which is it's going to happen. And now the teachers have to go where they can make the most money, that's closest to where they live, yeah. our teacher performers. So it's become much more of a gig economy, way more than it ever was. And people do not want to do a three-month rehearsal process to do one weekend of performance, especially because right. what we can pay for that doesn't, is not even as much as they could get doing a single gig because the funding is so bad. Right. And Boulder is a community that doesn't want to pay a high ticket price. Yeah. It's a very weird town. There's so much money here. Well, and something that kind of strikes me as you're talking and that, and it's something that I've actually kind of seen, maybe, well, I don't know, I'm just gonna say it and then if I'm wrong, you can prove me wrong. But or you can edit yourself out later. Type, oh yeah, <laughs> duh. So, um, I come from theater, but I come from very specific postmodern dance. I come from viewpoints. I come from that kind of work. Um, and a lot of what my interest was in college was large scale site specific kind of work, like what you're talking about, you know, band loop going off mm -hmm. the sides of buildings or even just installations that Mary would do in Washington Square Park or other places. Um, and I see less and less of that kind of work these days. It almost seems like, um, people are being contained to theaters or being contained to circus tent or like there, there's not that art is all around us anymore. Like I felt like the influence from the seventies and those kinds of movements were, which seems so silly to me because in light of the pandemic, you would think that more and more funding would be for outside events and things that are around in the community. And I'm wondering if you've noticed the same or like why that is what's going on there. Is it permits? Is it what? Well, well, I will say that there was some funding during the pandemic to do outdoor work, but it wasn't enough to produce the kind of work that I wanted to do, mm. first of all. And it was like suddenly there, there's a grant available now and you have to do this project in the next three months. I'm like, oh my God, no, I can't uh, pull uh, together yeah, sure. anywhere near the scope. I believe that the immersive experience has become the, partly the new thing that's happening. Oh, interesting. And a lot of the immersive is inside. Like the Meow Wolf. Yeah, Meow the... Wolf and Sleep No More. Yeah, uh, these kinds of... 
re and also VR and all the things that have happened with technology. So it's not so much being outside, it is being in some new environment where people can mm. experientially engage. So I, that's part of it. I do not yeah. think I could actually do the large scale projects I did uh, when I first started the company. The very first big one we did was called Primordial Urge Parts 1 and 2. Part one was in uh, the park along Boulder Creek by the library. And at the time we hung from the trees, which now we know better. <laughs> and they were cottonwoods. Oh, no. uh, but over the creek, we had live music uh, that was original music. We had uh, a sculptor who had, she made altars. And it was this very primal, like, part one was um, tree people. Mm. And so that was a huge cast with live music and visual art. And then the, it was a diptych, so the second piece of that was called Blacktop, and they were shutting down the drive-in theater. So we took over the drive-in theater and did an entire installation. What? We rappelled down the movie screen. Oh we my had God. flatbed trucks with hoist. I had a crane. There's actually a picture somewhere of me hanging from the crane. We had the live musicians on a flatbed truck. We had, we catered the concession stand. People sat in their cars and had a little speaker. We also had some chairs set up, and that was a huge project. So as, the, as this diptych, both the park and the drive-in, the funding for that, never minding permitting and just getting somebody to let you hang from a crane anymore. Yeah, Even sure. though we carry all the insurance, you know, all that stuff. Wow. It's much harder to do. Yeah, so, what's up with that? I don't know because, oh, I'd love to remount that piece. I would love to see that. I would love to be in that piece, by It the was way. fun. Yeah. If you ever need someone to repel out a movie screen yeah. from a drive-in theater, let me know. You and at intermission, we showed like the old cartoons, like Pepe Le Pew and yeah. you know, Bugs Bunny, whatever we had. It was really fun. That's so cool. Yeah, I collaborated with a junkyard, and we had the back half of an old car on a flatbed truck. We had a makeout scene. Yes. Uh, with a couple of dancers in front of what was playing on the movie screen, and that's where we got a lot of the parts that we were working with as apparatus. I mean, yeah, it was a huge project. Wow. I don't know what's going on. I, mean, I think maybe there are still people getting that kind of funding. funding. Um, but again, we're in... Because what it strikes me as is like what you're talking about with these very contained experiential kind of works is that it's easy to ticket them, right? Like you can like, you have to enter Meow Wolf and you have to pay a fee to get in. Sleep No More too, you have to buy a, you had to buy a ticket. I don't know. Queen of the Night, same, you had to buy it. And with uh, something like what you're talking about, like anybody could watch it, which is the beauty of art. Yeah. The park, anybody could watch it, although people did buy tickets. I don't know how we did that. But <laughs> definitely at the drive-in theater you, to get come in in your car. Right. Because you had to drive down this little road yeah. to get to it. So we were able to ticket it at the time. Um, but yeah, I don't, it yeah. is true, that whole idea of the outdoor work, which is why the projects that were, we were being offered money to do mm -hmm. were outdoors and sure. very hard to contain in terms of like revenue generation. The grant wasn't gonna cover all of it, how would we? Yeah. So, so maintaining a company is challenging right now. I'm having auditions this coming Saturday. We'll see what happens. Nice. I may shift how I'm running the company in the near term and oh, interesting. what kind of projects we do, whether it becomes more of a pickup company. I don't love that because I really want to be able to create work with the ensemble and yeah. build it from the people who are in the room. I think of myself like one would think of a painter. You have to have your your palette and your canvas and you're applying the whatever it is you need to make that particular thing come to fruition. Mm. So it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Interesting times and I, you know, I I'm grateful we're still here doing this. It has been one hell of a ride during the pandemic. And this being our first in-person festival and having you here, Shannon, is Thank so exciting. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy it's to so be exciting. here. And the people who have come for this festival, many of whom are new, but there are also people who have come year after year and it's their first time back. And it's been so rewarding it's to cool. have people come back and... Uh, just it's I'm I'm full of gratitude as I mentioned earlier. Amazing. Important. So I'm I'm ageless. I'm never going to go anywhere, right? <laughs> of course. So when I'm sitting down 20 years from now with my little test cam camera and I'm interviewing people who have trained from you, what do you think they'll say about you? What do you th as you talk about Terry Sengraff and Bob Davidson and all oh these people? Boy. What is your legacy? What do you project your legacy to be or hope it is? I don't actually know that I have an answer to that. I can say what I wish it would be. Sure. I will also say that at one point, you know, being a nonprofit, we have a board of directors and they like to suggest things. Early on, I think we did our first strategic planning retreat five years into the company. 
and they wanted to change the name of the company to the Nancy Smith Aerial Dance Company. I do have to confess, frequent flyers is very hard to Google because sometimes I get on oh, Delta. I know. So. Uh, that was a whole other thing because but we, <laughs> sorry we, to interrupt. Get, we, tra we <laughs> trademarked frequent flyers. Nice. And we had to go through a whole lot of legal stuff to make sure we could, but because we're not the same kind of business. Anyway, long uh, story short. Okay. Um, I said no because I wanted the company to live beyond my name. Mm. Uh, so we kept frequent flyers as the name, and now we have frequent flyers registered trademark, aerial dance festival, Reach frequent flyers, registered trademark, professional training program, yeah, you know, whatever. It's become sort of the, the basis for all the other things we do, our yeah. studio, blah, blah, yeah. blah. I hope what people will say is that I was so wildly creative that I enabled other people to find their creativity and pursue their passion. Mm. We have launched many people out into the world uh, just from our own programming, the festival. This was mm -hmm. sometimes the launching pad for many artists I've heard over and over. I had one of our professional training students come up to me at the show this weekend and say, you literally changed my life. Mm. And I, I started to well up. And then she looked at me again and she said, you literally changed my life. So I hope that people will say that. I know our Youth at Risk program has literally saved some lives. Wow. We've been a second home for some kids who otherwise, I don't think they'd still be here. Well, they've told me, literally told me if it hadn't been for frequent flyers, I would not be on the planet. So I hope that we inspire people, that we encourage the pursuit of whatever the dream is that they have, not necessarily even Ariel, but finding, I, I think we help them find their wings. Mm. So that's my goal. It's beautiful. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> All right, anything else? Am I missing anything? I, I will say that it's very interesting to be at my age yeah. as an aerialist. And, yeah. you know, Terry, when she came to the festival the first time, was 64, which is my age. I'm just going to own it and say it out yes. loud. Yes. And she was so 40 next year. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <quite> <laughs> sorry. Getting on the dole. <laughs> yes. Terry performed for the last time at our festival. We didn't even have a regular performance like you just did. It was just in a warehouse space. The dairy hadn't yet built the mm -hmm. theater. It was informal, we were doing a lec dem, and she, I have a video of it, it's the most beautiful thing you'll ever see. It's her signature, it's called um, Sincerely Terry, and it's her signature solo. Um, it relaunched Terry's career coming to the festival that year, and then she came for many years after and, and, and created work on her muses, her dancers, that she brought every year. I am wondering what will happen for me next. I think I often get viewed as um, you know, as you do in your aging, nothing to offer, you know, mm. physically, I don't do really hard things. It's not about that anymore. Right. It's about how you're saying what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Plus, I teach invented apparatus, which I love. And the relationship of improv to Ariel and that is a foundational tool. And I'm also seen as a producer administrator versus mm. an artistic person. Yeah. And I don't like getting pigeonholed there. It's kind of um, a double-edged sword to have the skill sets that I have, both the business side and the artistic. And some people only know me in this sort of like, I'm producing this or I'm producing that. Yeah. Um, so, that, so I'm curious about what's going to happen and how I will maintain my um, courage and desire to keep making work in the face of a world in which as you age, you have less value. And I, it, it's also why I think this whole lineage thing is important. What That's can I point. learn from these people? I learned so much from my quote unquote elders. And as Susan Murphy said, as you know, she helped us create a panel called Still Drinking from the Cup While Passing It Along. And I love that idea so much. It's not like you have to hand the cup over fully, you're sharing it. And there's right. so much mutual respect and exchange that happens. I'm constantly learning from all the people around me, younger, older, everyone. Um, you know, sort of the fast fix, me, me, ma, me, me, me culture mm -hmm. is hard. I think it's very hard. Yeah. So, well, I, and I'm speaking to, I mean, just being in Ireland and speaking to Chantal McCormick, who's about 10 years, she won't mind, like about 10 years younger than you, but is kind of coming into that. Um, phase of her life as well and something that she was talking about was how 
you know, they don't really teach you how to get old. <laughs> That's what she said. She was like, you know, they don't really teach you how to get old. And it's like, so many people are so fascinated by, you know, developmental psychology and what happens when you're young, what happens when you're very, very little, right? Because we've all lived through being very, very little, right? And we've all lived through adolescence and we've all seen the impact of that. But then as you age into your 60s, 70s, 80s, like what is that trajectory for the artist? And what is that experience? And it's not like you can reflect on it you have to like live it and transmit it at the same time. Yeah. Oh wow, yes. Complicated. You know, it, it sounds very complicated. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I will also say that um, Chantal, Lindsay Butcher, and Fred Deb, who all started festivals, it's because they came to the Aerial Dance Festival. Yes. And when they first started their festivals, I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> nobody's going to come to our festival anymore. And then I had to get over that because that was that's just silly. Um, and I'm proud of the fact that there's this that it went other places yeah, um, and that they're doing, you know, really different things from what we're doing. I really respect that. When I started the festival too, way back in the day, I had hoped that there would be more of an exchange. Like I would bring so-and-so here and then they would bring me there or mm -hmm. my company. But it turned out there weren't enough other people actually producing anything. Yeah. I was just bringing people over. Right. So there hasn't been that exchange to the degree, although Eileen, who was just here, yes. Circus Boss, had brought me to her festival. Yes. And then Nanette Paloma in um, Santa Barbara brought me out. So that was lovely. But being in the where I am in the country, it's a little isolating. So that's also dovetailing with this whole thing of aging and purpose and right. how one is viewed. Oh, um, yeah. I'm trying to be a better role model. It is very hard. It is very hard. <laughs> it just is. Yeah. You know, it's hard to, hard to um, not say stupid things about being older or, or stupid things about how I feel maybe someone is perceiving me. I'm trying to watch what I say and just you know, do my thing and be representative that way. And remember Terry and Bob and yeah. Susan and all the people who are, um, you know, the next next decade older than me. Yeah. Uh, and how they how they walked with such grace mm. into this into that next chapter. That's dope. Also, you don't have to walk with grace if you don't want to. You can be messy and loud and. Oh, I'm gonna curse a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to, you know, you, there's that thing everybody says. It's kind of a trope that as you get older, you just don't care what people think and you say what you're thinking. Well, I've never had much of a filter. Great. So I will say that I I do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And I probably will do more of it. Love especially it. Especially calling people out, you know, in a nice way. Right. Trying to just encourage people to shift their thinking, perhaps. What advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career or someone else who wants to have the career of Nancy Smith, what would you tell them? You know, I'm, I'm torn between, there's some lessons I learned the hard way, uh, one of which was, it actually has to do with gratitude. Uh, Marta Kern, who started the Colorado Dance Festival, took me under her wing when I was starting the Aerial Dance Festival, showed me how to write grants. Uh -huh. Actually, when I was starting Frequent Flyers, before even doing marketing and then teaching tra uh, dance trapeze. So I hadn't thanked her at the Colorado Dance Festival. And one point she just said to me, you know, what, hey, she called me out. And it was such an awakening for me. I was, I realized that I needed to do more of that. When I started, there were enough people saying, you can't possibly do that. Like that big thing, primordial urge. There were so many people in the community saying, you can't pull that off. And I had very much the, oh yeah, watch this. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that got me a long ways, but it also wasn't the sort of, I mean, there's tons of collaboration. I don't even know how to describe this. It was a little too hard-edged. Yeah. And maybe... Doing things for the sake of revenge, that energy runs out after a while. A little bit. It wasn't yeah. even revenge. It was just like, I knew I could do it, and by God, I was going to do it. And it and I did, and it was yes. amazing, and I showed them. It wasn't about even showing them. I just knew I could do it, and I hate when people tell me, you can't possibly do that. I do not like that. So I would say to people coming up, or my younger self, actually, my younger self, know that you actually can do it. You can do it a little more gently. Mm. Um, you will keep doing it. There are going to be some of the hardest things you've ever experienced in your life trying to do this over 30, it'll be our 35th anniversary next year. And it's all going to be okay, no matter what. Mm. Be grateful and trust. And, you know, keep that fire in the belly because you need it. 
Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to roll over and pull the covers over your head, and that's it. Go out. Yep. And look for your angels and allies and friends and build a good support network. You know, love that. Yeah. Nancy Smith, thank you for having me at this festival, <laughs> and thank you for coming on the podcast. It's so much my pleasure. Both of those. I'm very pleasure. grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening, friends, fans, and foes. I'll talk at you next week. In the meantime, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and show some love, send some support, just like these fine Patreons that you are about to hear the voices of right now. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful Northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website domupsidedown.com. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we've got a place for you.